Hi, Dr. Isom here with the first part of the Chapter 17 lecture. In this one, I'm going to talk about the definition of personality disorders, how personality disorders are diagnosed, the controversy that arose with the creation of the DSM-5, and the current state of personality disorder diagnosis. First, I'll start off with this somewhat comical pictorial or infographic about the personality disorders. And in this one, this is a little bit dated of a graphic because you can see that they have an additional personality disorder and that's passive aggressive. Now that's not considered to be a personality disorder anymore, but it's still kind of a fun way to think about the different types of disorders because for example, you can look for the narcissist. And the narcissist is the car here, which is number two. And you can see it has to be the largest car with the most prominent hood ornament. I'll talk about each of these different disorders in detail in part two of this lecture. But in this lecture, what I want to do is discuss the definition of personality disorders or what, what is a personality disorder, the current state of diagnosis, how clinicians diagnose these disorders, I will, like I said, go into the characteristics of each of those 10 major disorders in the next lecture, but I do want to talk about the controversy that arose in the problems with diagnosis and the problems with something called comorbidity, which is probably a word you're familiar with. It just means in this case that if you're diagnosed with a personality disorder, it's likely that you have more than one personality disorder, even up to five different personality disorders at the same time. It often happens that a person might be diagnosed with more than one because there seems to be a lot of overlap between the characteristics of the different disorders. So I'll talk about those. I was going to discuss how personality is related to physical health, but I think we're going to drop this from the chapter so that we can limit our discussion to personality disorders. Well, as you know from the semester, one of the main focuses, actually probably the main focus for the semester, is to realize that people are different. We're different in meaningful ways, and those meaningful differences can be measured. And when we talk about differences in personality, we are focusing on people's feelings, people's thoughts and beliefs, and people's behaviors as being different. And those differences in their personality, remember that's the psychological triad, those differences are fairly stable. Now, it's a good thing that people are different, right? Because can you imagine if we all were the same, if we all liked the same things, it would be really boring. And so it's a good thing that not everybody has the same likes and dislikes. However, there are some people that have levels of differences in some characteristics that are maladaptive. And they're maladaptive because their behavior is so extreme that disrupts their interpersonal relationships. So there are consequences for people's mental and physical health when they have personality disorders. And so it's important to be able to identify each of the disorders as well as any particular treatments or therapies that can be addressed at those disorders. So what are the traits in personality disorders that present problems? Well, some of them include traits that are socially undesirable, like lack of empathy, for example, or extreme levels of introversion that prevent a person from interacting socially. What we're talking about here are patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving that are beyond the normal range of psychological variation. But we have to be really careful when we think about that because the normal range of psychological variation is dependent on multiple things. For one, it's dependent on culture. There are behaviors in our culture that we consider to be normal and appropriate and within the range of normal behavior that other cultures would disagree. And other cultures have behaviors that are considered appropriate that we might consider aberrant or extreme. We also need to think about the temporal context because there are some behaviors that we might consider to be a personality disorder related behavior now that 50, 75 years ago, those would not have been considered to be abnormal. For example, my great grandmother never got a driver's license. It just wasn't considered to be appropriate for women in that time to have a driver's license. It was expected that they would rely completely on men or their partner to drive them around and to take care of all of those things. Somebody today who insisted on having somebody else to constantly drive them around and relied on another person for everyday things might qualify as a dependent personality disorder person. So the temporal context is really important too, not just the culture, but the temporal context. 
Another issue is that there really isn't a dividing line, a clear dividing line that differentiates what we would consider normal and appropriate from disordered personality. And like I said, this line shifts from culture to culture, but it also shifts temporally too. And so what was considered normal many years ago, a couple decades ago, might be considered abnormal now. And in the future, we could anticipate that perhaps some of the behaviors we consider to be within the normal range might be considered abnormal then. Personality disorders are fairly prevalent because if you count up all the prevalence for each of the 10 disorders, what you will find is that it counts up to about 15% of our population. So you can say that out of every 100 people, it's likely that 15% would qualify as having at least one of these disorders. And again, remember that if you have one disorder, it's very likely that you qualify for more than one because there is a comorbidity issue. Personality disorders became a thing, a diagnostic category, with the publication of the first DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. That came out in the 50s, and there have been many revisions since then. The current version is the DSM-5, and that was published in 2013. With the DSM-5, there was a really strong push to go for diagnostic criteria that were research-based very strongly empirically evidence-based criteria for diagnosis. As far as the personality disorders, there was a push by personality researchers to consider personality disorders, really how we think of them when we're thinking about what makes a personality disorder a disorder, it's abnormal and extreme behavior. So personality researchers were trying to get the clinicians to diagnose personality disorders by measuring personality characteristics, dimensional traits, and then establishing whether or not someone had an extremely high level or an extremely low level of one or more traits that then would qualify them as having a personality disorder. And the research does support this idea that the personality disorders can be reliably measured using standardized tests that all clinicians could use, they could share the same diagnostic criteria. And so that way everyone was excited about it. There were lots of meetings. They developed a way to do a dimensional assessment. And this may not seem unusual to you yet because I haven't told you how they diagnose personality disorders currently, but I will in a minute. And they prepared all the materials for the new DSM-5. And this was right before the last edition of the Funder textbook was published. And so Funder, in this chapter on personality disorders, actually includes the criteria that the DSM-5 committee was planning to use. But at the last minute, they decided they were going to go back to the old method of diagnosis. The old method of diagnosis was simply whether or not the clinician thought you had a personality disorder, and if the clinician thought that you had one, they would pick which one or ones that you had. And that was it. It was just clinical impression. So there was this push to move towards empirical, standardized, measurement-based diagnosis. But there was such a resistance from the clinicians. Everybody would have to change the way that they diagnose personality disorders that they decided they absolutely didn't want to do that. And so what they ended up doing is they put this new form of diagnosis, this dimensional diagnosis, into the appendix. And so what you'll find when you read this chapter is that there are only really six personality disorders that are discussed, even though there are actually 10, and 10 are currently diagnosed at this current time. But the idea was to get rid of four of the disorders keep six, and also to use a dimensional assessment. So there will be a little bit of a difference between what I talk about in this lecture and what Funder presents in his book. What you will be assessed on is what I talk about in this lecture. Okay, as I mentioned, there are now two systems for diagnosing personality disorders. One, the old way, and that is the clinician just makes a decision as to whether or not a person has a disorder and which one or ones they have. And the second way is to do assessment with standardized personality tests. They're both in the DSM-5. The old way is included in the main section of the book. The clinical impression diagnosis method is in the main section. And the dimensional assessment method is in the appendix. Okay, why do we have the DSM? I think I got a little ahead of myself, so I'll catch up. But the reason for the DSM is, one, so that when clinicians have a patient and that patient is referred to another clinician, 
everybody knows what's going on. They have a diagnosis. The diagnosis is something that gives you a list of behaviors or issues. And so both clinicians will have a good understanding of what that person's like. The second reason, which seems kind of strange, but it's true, is so that clinicians could bill insurance companies. They needed a standardized way to bill insurance companies. So again, the purposes of the DSM is to try and increase the objectivity, knowing exactly what a client's issues are from clinician to clinician so that everyone's on the same page and also to improve billing, to make billing easier. Okay, what are personality disorders? Well, there are five characteristics that can be used to describe personality disorders, but there are two that every personality disorder has. So that's what I'm gonna to present to you first. These two characteristics are that there are unusually extreme personality attributes. So these are extreme within the current cultural and temporal context. So their personality is very extreme or some attributes of their personality are extreme. Now this could be just a denial of reality or maybe a distortion of reality. For example, if someone has a personality characteristic of extreme suspicion and paranoia, they might truly believe that nobody can be trusted. So that can't be true. That's a distortion of reality. There's got to be people that are trustworthy. So that's an example of an unusually extreme personality attribute. Another one is for the person with avoidant personality disorder. They may believe that they are completely unlovable. There's no way anybody could love them. And so that's one of the beliefs that they have. Now that is distortion of reality as well. At least I like to believe that. The other characteristic is that these extreme attributes cause problems and they cause problems interpersonally either for that person they may increase their anxiety and their depression or they might have confusion as far as relating to people or they create problems for others as for others i mean people who have to interact with that person on a daily basis so again the two are unusually extreme personality attributes and these are extreme behaviors, thoughts, or feelings, personality attributes within the current cultural context, and problematic behavior. So it either creates problems for that person, or it creates problems for others who have to interact with that person. There are three other characteristics that can be true about personality disorders. One of them is that they may affect social relationships and interactions. They are stable over time, and by that I mean they can begin in childhood or in adolescence, and they usually persist throughout adulthood. Really, personality disorders are difficult to change, even with therapy. In fact, there are some personality disorders that are almost impossible to change. We don't really have a good therapy right now for antisocial personality disorder for people that truly have it. But then there are other personality disorders, such as borderline personality disorder, that there is a specific therapy that was developed, and it can be very effective. The last characteristic is that it can be egocentric. So egocentric means that it is such a ingrained part of who that person is, this extreme behavior, that they don't see it as a problem. They think that this is normal and they think these are valued parts of their personality. If, if you have a personality disorder that's egocentric, one of the things I like to say is that it's synonymous with that person's idea of who they are. It doesn't cause them any problems or they don't perceive that there are any problems caused by that. And they think other people are the ones with the problem. Now this is in opposition to other personality disorders that may be egodystonic. So if you have a personality disorder that's egodystonic, then you know it's a problem. You know that it's creating problems for you or for other people. You know that there's a dysfunctional part of your personality. So the difference between the two is egocentric means that if you have an egocentric personality disorder, you don't think you have a problem. Whereas egodystonic, you know it's creating a problem for you. It's creating a problem in your relationships or just in your general happiness with your life. I'll talk about the personality disorders that are thought to be egocentric, but one of them would be antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and often obsessive compulsive personality disorder are considered 
to be egocentric because the person doesn't realize that their behavior is a problem or is creating problems. Whereas something like avoidant personality disorder, where it causes extreme emotional distress for an individual when they think that they are unlovable and they avoid social interaction because they're terrified they're going to be criticized, that's pretty dysfunctional. And so that is why that particular personality disorder is considered ego dystonic. Okay, I talked briefly about diagnosis before, but let me just try and clear that up a little bit. The basis for personality disorder diagnosis right now, we thought it was going to change, but it didn't, but the basis right now is clinical impression. Whether or not the clinician, the PhD psychologist or the therapist or the social worker believes that you have a personality disorder or not. So they often base this on interviews in talking, like intake interviews, but I think most of them would argue that it's clinical intuition. Many clinicians say, oh, I can totally spot somebody with borderline, or I can completely spot someone with narcissistic personality disorder really in just a few minutes because they have seen it so many times that it's easy to identify. So that is how they are diagnosed currently. This is a very flexible way of doing it. And clinicians argue that we're just using common sense. And once you know what the characteristics of each of the disorders is, it's a really easy thing to identify a personality disorder like that. The problem is it seems like there's a little bit of overconfidence in that clinicians who feel that they are very good and they can spot those disorders easily often don't agree on the same person. And again, another thing is the comorbidity issue one clinician might identify or spot a particular personality disorder and a different clinician would spot a totally different one. Now there is a lot of overlap on the symptoms of personality disorder, so that makes a lot of sense. But overall, when you look at the research that establishes whether or not clinicians are making reliable diagnoses, whether different clinicians agree upon the same disorder for the same person, it's really not that reliable. And that was the push to develop another way of measuring personality disorders and diagnosing personality disorders so that there was higher reliability in identifying people's disorders. Something that is continually happening is that psychologists are really trying to figure out the best way to organize these maladaptive personality characteristics into a list of disorders that isn't overlapping and that is very reliable in terms of everybody's going to come up with the same personality disorder for the same person, and that will continue. Okay, so let me take this back to the beginning of the semester. Remember when we talked about the differences between types and traits, right? You can measure personality types, and with a personality type, you have somebody who has a number of different traits that combine to form that personality type. Now, one of the ones I've talked about in class, and I know it's listed in this chapter, is the type A. So the type A person has this grouping of traits. And that would include high levels of hostility, high levels of competitiveness, irritability, impatience, right? All of those traits combine to form that type. That's how they think about personality disorders. You have this combination or constellation of traits, and the combination of those traits is what forms that personality disorder. So you can think of it, each of the personality disorders, as being a bucket, right? Remember, a type is like a bucket. You're either that type or you're not. And people who are not personality disordered, they would fit into the normal bucket. So you can think about the personality disorders as 10 of these little buckets, and each one of these buckets has its name, whether it's narcissistic personality disorder or antisocial personality disorder or obsessive compulsive or paranoid, etc. And so in order to get a diagnosis of that disorder, you have to match that constellation of traits to fit into that disorder. Okay, so that's how diagnosis currently happens. One of the problems with this was the unreliability issue that I was just talking about because clinicians weren't making reliable decisions as far as what personality disorder or disorders a specific individual had. Now, there's a link in this PowerPoint right there. I encourage you to watch that. It gives you a little bit more information about the problems with making a diagnosis using a typology. And that's really how it's been presented in all of the DSMs, including the DSM-5, even though they thought they were going to switch to this more empirically based dimensional model. Let's think of the dimensional view. If you measure extreme levels of personality traits, 
and you can identify personality disorders when people actually are measured as having high levels of personality disorders. The idea is that you're going to have a little bit more reliable way of diagnosing those disorders. So what you might do is think about each one of the traits that you would measure. And the ones that they're talking about measuring are very similar to the big five, a little bit more extreme view of the big five. But let's say social dominance, which is like extroversion. Most people would probably fall somewhere here in the middle. These are the people who are sometimes dominant and sociable and sometimes they're not. Over here, we have typical extroverts. And over here, we have the typical introverts. These are the people that are a little bit less dominant socially. When we're talking about personality disorders, we're talking about people that are way over here on the edges of the normal distribution. So this would be the person who had extreme levels of that trait. And over here, only people who are measuring on this part of the normal distribution would be considered having extreme levels of a personality trait or traits that would probably qualify them as having a personality disorder. And it wouldn't just be one trait. There would be all five factors would be measured in addition to a couple of other dimensional measures in order to get the most reliable and accurate diagnosis possible. Now, if you want to know how to do this, if for some reason you think this is really fascinating, Look in the appendix of the DSM-5. It gives instructions for how to do that. On the other hand, if you need to know how people diagnose personality disorders for this exam, for this class, well, here's how they do it. They diagnose it with the bucket method. You either fit the description of the personality disorder or you don't. And here's one of the issues it creates, though, because remember, when we have a typology, can you be in two buckets at the same time or three or four? No, you can't. It's against the idea of a typology. And this is one of the issues that comes up. Here's an example of that. You've probably heard of borderline personality disorder. When you're diagnosing a personality disorder with the DSM-5, for each disorder, you're given a list of symptoms. And this list of symptoms is a list of possible behaviors that a person with that disorder might have. To qualify for a diagnosis of the disorder, the patient or client has to have a minimum number of the symptoms. For example, these are seven possible symptoms that a person with borderline personality disorder might have. However, you only have to have five of the seven symptoms. And as you can see, they're really different from each other. Frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment, reflecting intolerance to be alone, unstable and intense relationships, Recurrent suicidal gestures or threats or self-mutilation like cutting. Marked mood reactivity or emotional dysregulation. That's really the hallmark symptom of borderline personality disorder. Some call it emotional hemophilia. And I will go into that in more detail in the next lecture. Chronic feelings of emptiness. Frequent displays of inappropriate or intense anger. Or stress-related paranoid ideation, paranoia, or severe dissociative symptoms feelings like you're not part of your physical body. So you can see those are all pretty different symptoms and behaviors. The problem with that is you can qualify for having borderline personality disorder with any five of those symptoms. And that results in people with the same personality disorder who appear to be very different. You can qualify as having borderline personality disorder with any five of those symptoms. And so really what that boils down to is there are 256 ways to qualify for a borderline personality disorder diagnosis. That just leads into unreliability because you can have two individuals with borderline personality. One can be completely paranoid and expressing intense anger and rage, whereas the other one may be committing rage on themselves in suicidal gestures or self-mutilation, who may have unstable and intense relationships. They might have very different symptoms and yet they both fit into that same bucket. That's kind of a problem. Okay, what's the difference between the old system and the new proposed system? Well, the old system, there are 10 major disorders and they're in three different clusters. And that is how I'm going to teach you about it because that is the way currently with the DSM-5, which was published in 2013, that personality disorders are diagnosed. The clusters are cluster A, which are those disorders that are associated with ways of thinking that are odd or strange. Cluster B is the personality disorders that are associated with impulsiveness or unusual, strange patterns of behavior. And then cluster C has to do with the anxious, 
high anxiety and avoidant emotional styles. Again, I will talk about those in detail in the next lecture. The new system, which I talked about before, dropped those 10 disorders to six. So they deleted four disorders. And this was partially to address that overlap of people, if they were diagnosed with one personality disorder, they were probably gonna qualify for another. Eliminating or reducing the personality disorders to six was potentially going to reduce that problem. There were no clusters in the new system. And the assessment of personality or extreme patterns of personality were done by using dimensional questionnaires. So you would give somebody a questionnaire or interview them with a structured interview to identify where they fit on the normal distribution and then use that as the establishment as to whether they're personality disordered or not. But as I talked about before, at the last minute, that new system was scrapped and it was put into the appendix. And so currently, we diagnose personality disorders using those 10 disorders in three clusters that I mentioned previously. And that wraps up the introduction to personality disorders. The next lecture will cover each of the 10 disorders in detail.